Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dial the Gate, the Stargate Oral History Project. My name is David Reed. I am privileged to welcome uh, one of the greatest villains that uh, the franchise has known, Robert Davi. We know him as Acostas Kolya, but you may know him from several different things. Uh, Mr. Davi, Robert Davi, sir, thank you so much for being here with me. It is a pleasure to to have you. And uh, I've been looking forward to talking with you sometime about this extraordinary character. How are you, sir? I'm good, and I'm trying to get the light. Is it, how's the light behind you? You look good. Behind me, it's okay? It's not yeah. glaring? Okay, good. No, it's not too I, bad at all. It's not too bad at all. Getting, uh, you know, shattered by my, my glare. No, you're good. I, I really appreciate uh, you you being with me, sir. Um, tell me yeah, about okay. some of your memories of this uh, uh, extraordinary character and role. And tell me how you're doing these days. Just Stargate. in general. Yes. Stargate Atlantis. Stargate Atlantis. Yes. I remember... You know, I had done Predator, too, yes. and uh, not much sci-fi. And I remember Stargate, the agent at the time, said, hey, Stargate wants you to do some recurring character. All right. I says, they sent me the script. Augustus Collier, interesting character. I like the name, Augustus Collier. You know, it has a ring to it. And uh, so we did it and uh, spoke to the... Uh, uh, the, the writing team and the production team, and they were very open to my ideas. There were certain things I wanted to change, and they were very open to all my changes and even the wardrobe ideas, and it, that was very collaborative. And uh, I remember having a good time with the cast. Um, uh, we shot it in Vancouver, mm. and... Um, yeah, I, we did The Storm and the Eye. I think those were the first two episodes that we were drenched and it was kind of interesting to have those you know climate change aspects to the to the uh, to, a, to to the to the series and to be uh, acting under those conditions is fun. And um, you know Shepard of course uh, that was fun all the cast was terrific people they were a lot of fun and uh, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think back. I just always thought that, yeah, I did, I did a lot of changing, a lot of uh, uh, collaboration with them in terms of the script, you know what I mean? Making the character fit myself. Uh, I think the, the most frustrating part was I wasn't in great shape for those initial Taekwondo things. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, you, you did a lot, of, a lot of that physicality. I mean, there was a lot of that, and that was like, you know, you need, come on, you're going to do that, you got a, a month, you need a month rehearsal. You get there the next day, okay, we're doing these moves, and you can't, you can't, uh, unless you're already an expert at that, which I was not. I wasn't uh, ever, uh, I did a little bit of martial arts, a lot of dance and stuff, but to, to go into there and do all that stick work, that was, I think that was uh, the, the frustrating aspect to that for me there because I would want to have been crispy with him, you know what I mean? And for that, you can't do it overnight. Uh, that was frustration. But the other times, it was it was fun. It was fun uh, uh, creating Augustus Collier. I thought he was a little short-lived. I thought they could have done more to the character. I always saw him as joining forces with them for a period of time. I said, it makes sense. Why? Why not? I mean, you have a strong presence of this character, and I, you know, uh, uh, and it was interesting that they they don't see that sometimes. The audience sees it, but the producers they don't see it. They're locked into something else. They could have easily made Kolya a, a character that helped Shepard and the rest of them fight, and then they could have had there. You know, it's like China and Russia right now joining forces. I mean, it, it, what happens in America and the allies it, you, you do that and then you break up and then you you know it's like world war ii with the, the russia and the, and the, and the, uh, the allies so you could have done something like that and justified the the antagonism that they felt toward each other's lifestyles 
You know, it's interesting because at the end of uh, season one, they do hook up with the Janai briefly to to coordinate uh, some weaponry. But Koya isn't there. He's kind of stepped out to the side. And it's like every time they wanted the Janai as an antagonist, you were brought in front and center. And it's it's beautiful because it works so great. The antagonism between him and Shepard, they were per they were excellent foils for each other. They really hated each other. Well, you could have had that continue on, and that could have just been a political frustration within it. Imagine being in there and having that tension all the, you know, quite a, a little more frequently mm. because they're both vying for power. They're both vying to take the Stargate a certain way. And uh, they could have, uh, you know, I think, uh, who's the creator? Joe, right? Joseph Malazzi, Paul Molly, and Brad Wright and Rob Cooper. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. All those cats. They were good guys. Um, uh, it was interesting. Very interesting. Tell me about who this character was for you on the page and how you brought him to life. Was he a mercenary? Was he? How, how did he feel about uh, working for his government the way he was? Was he just a razor that when, when they needed some something sliced open, they would call him in and he would get the job done? Who was Collier to you? Collier to me was uh, Kurtz in the Heart of Darkness that didn't go so over the edge. But had political ambitions mm. and um, he was unlike any kind of, you know, politician warrior. It was a patent. Mm. It was a general patent that had a different idea in terms of how to handle this stuff. And you had the political people like Eisenhower and the other generals, but Patton was more of a warrior general. Mm. And had they listened to him, it would be different. Could have been different. Uh, he got, you know, he was tough. Uh, so I saw him more like a, a warrior leader as opposed to a, a tool for something else. He had, a, for my own thing, I had a, a different agenda behind it, that whole, and that was to take over the Stargate. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a, it's a tool with, with remarkable power behind it. And uh, I did want to get inside Shepard's head, don't forget. <laughs> I would think after he shot him, Back through the start, back through the wormhole, like kick, getting kicked out of out of the house, um, it it would have gotten pretty personal for Collier pretty quick. Like like there there would have been other things added to his agenda alongside you know personal power. It's like okay, I've got to get this guy back, and I'm not going to let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have the, look. It's like every politics. Look what we're going through today, American politics and any politics throughout the world. You know, you have allies, you have uh, detractors, you have conflict, and um, it's uh, you have alliances. It's a very interesting day, the whole thing. But uh, yeah, Kolya, I think the revenge aspect was a little too petty for him. Mm. It wasn't uh, so much his revenge as control. Um, and, um, you know, and... Again, that's in my subtextual analysis. It's not necessarily on the page, but it would lead to a few things, you know, if you uh, go back and look at some some instances, because he was formidable. Mm -hmm. There, I, I've had some conversations with uh, Tori Higginson and David Hewlett about being drenched. Um, out in that uh, uh, soundstage, yeah. and it was just before they were going on break, and Tori said that everyone got sick, and they gave everyone after that shoot was done like bottles of wine or something because they knew that they were all going to go home. Not well. Did you, did you did you manage to survive that, or did you get sick as well? I don't remember. I don't think I got sick. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I. I don't remember. You know, but it was intense. It was intense, that stuff. You know, and um, it was um, it was fun. Those conditions are always fun. Do they help drive the performance or do they distract you from the performance? 
No, no, because you're soaked in rain. Well, you're in that condition. So you're in that condition and you're going to battle and you're in a, in a, in a circumstance. So you're going to have yourself, uh, 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 it adds, it's a condition that adds. Sometimes an actor will put himself in that condition mentally or psychically to give something to a performance. You know, he's fighting the elements. He may not, he might be in a quiet office, but he's fighting the elements. You know what I mean? And that gives you another impulse that you have to then project something else on, but you don't know that. You just know, man, where's this guy getting this stuff from? So you, you know, uh, uh, so to have it, have the circumstance, because that's what we do as actors. We live truthfully in the given circumstances. So most of the time you have to imagine, you know, imaginary circumstances. Here, it was created for you. So that was helpful. Mm. What do you look for when you are playing uh, someone whom the audience recognizes is an antagonist? Um, you've played you've played some deuces over the years from Bond villains, I mean to the Goonies. Uh, what what do you what angle do you come at it from? When you're you're looking at one of these parts, do you say do you do you see that they're the hero of their own story, or how how do you approach an antagonist as an actor, you personally? Not as an antagonist. Yeah. I never comment whether, and even when I did profiling, I was the mm. good guy, FBI. You know, I mean, I remember at the actor's studio, Lee Strasberg. There's a legendary story he gave, and I come from the. I'm a member of the actor's studio, study with Adler, you know, did all the stuff that actors used to do before social media arose. Uh, you know, we, we had intense training, craft of acting, the art of acting. Um, but the, my approach is, is uh, uh, to find the human being. Mm -hmm. And then the circumstances and the actions that he plays, an audience can justify. You know, the audience will look at, oh, that's terrible. Or they might go, I like this guy. What's up? What about him? What? He's interesting. I think no matter what, uh, a lot of people have always said that when I played even the, you know, an antagonist or the baddie or the, the evil, there's something they like about him. There's something they like about him. They find something they, oh, that's interesting. They don't want to like the guy. And that makes you hate him even more sometimes. But... <laughs> Right? It's like, why am, I, why am I appreciating this guy? So I, I, I want to seduce the audience into coming on that, believing that journey as opposed to, because uh, I hate when I see a cardboard villain or a villain that's just, you know, the old style twirling of the mustache. That repels me away. I want to do something that brings the audience to me, brings them into this, even though it's uh, not necessarily... Uh, uh, the, uh, and, but I have, uh, I have not played characters. I've turned down characters that have had a very banal uh, and uh, sometimes not nice. Uh, 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 something that I don't feel, uh, you know. Again, like you, you're offered characters as a bad guy. You know, that could, that could be, you know. Uh, against this or against that, or be very bigoted, and I won't play a big of any kind. That's where you lose an audience. The other thing is all fun, but I won't play a bigot. And uh, sometimes there are characters that uh, have that, and I then say, let's lose that aspect to it. Well, if you don't think that you're going to be able to portray it honestly and truthfully within the boundaries of yourself as a human being, and then extending that out to you as a performer, then, you know, I, I agree, you know, don't waste anyone's time trying, you know, if you're not going to be able to give yourself fully to the performance, then find another one. Yeah. And, and that's, and, and that's just, it's just, you know, certain things, you know, uh, are, are, let's say taboo, so to speak, mm -hmm. that, are not, you know, you don't want to portray that in, in, in an art form mm -hmm. anyway. 
Absolutely. And on top of that, you have children. And it's like, you know, what I, I they're going to be potentially seeing this. You know, what kind of messages do I want to do I want to give? You know, what does what does my art say about myself? Exactly. Is that is that aspect to it? You know, because the art to me is a pure form. You know, life, we go all over the place. We can be all over the place because that's just but the art form lasts. You know, you're, 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 and now social media does to a certain extent, but mm-hmm. the art form does last. And um, that's your message in a way. Mm-hmm. Well, it's what you leave to the world. So, yeah. exactly. Um, was there any, uh, any memories that you have of working with Joe Flanagan specifically? Because he was really the, I mean, aside from the storm in the eye, where it was really Weir and McKay working against you and you against them, there was a lot of contact between you and Shepard throughout the run. And I've been reading through the comments, you know, in anticipation for this. That's really what people, the audience, sunk their teeth into. Do you do you have any stories or memories specifically of working with Joe and and accessing the relationship between Kolya and Shepard in these stories? Just that he and I got along marvelously. You know, we liked each other, from what I recollect, and uh, were very friendly to each other. And it was a lot of fun. You know, it's like a uh, any kind of little competition um, without it being competitive. It was just, you know, playing our characters and enjoying that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there was, there was no... Uh, uh, you know, again, I, w- I always saw Shepard as, as someone that uh, even Collier would be able to, you know, I think he hated me more than I hated him. <laughs> <laughs> I think he disliked Augustus Collier more than Augustus Collier disliked Shepard. Yeah, I, I, I could... Shepard was like boy and blood to, call, to Collier. <laughs> I could see under the right set of circumstances... Um, them putting aside their, if the hour were dark enough, I could see them putting aside their um, uh, their animosity and striving towards a greater goal and perhaps learning something about each other begrudgingly, Shepard particularly begrudgingly, in the process. That's how I wanted it. That's how I wanted it, the future of Augustus Cody to be. Yeah. I wanted to do that turnaround and I had mentioned it to them, to mm-hmm. the writers. Uh, it would be great if now there was this thing that had that mutual need that brought us together, that had bring us together. And then out of that, a friendship emerged. Mm-hmm. And then there could be some other battle with and now Augustus, Augustus Cody dies heroically. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Battle uh, uh, with, uh, with Cody, uh, with, uh, with Shepard. Robert. But, oh, the- please go ahead. I apologize. Please finish your thought. No, no, no. That was it. That was it. I just was finishing it. You have had such a body of work. Is there a specific role that helped shape you as an artist in ways that you didn't expect or um, made you think about your, your, your place in the world and your place as a person in ways that you didn't anticipate? Well, I think that, um, just being human awakens you, you know? I mean, the, the again, Stella Adler, who was my mentor, a great woman, uh, you, you, and we I had always been very self-aware of the world, the surroundings. I, me and my cousins used to do political skits back in the 60s when we were 10 years old, you know what I mean? <laughs> Before... Saturday Night Live did skits and stuff like that. So there was always some kind of uh, something that uh, was was flirting around the background of, of life. Uh, but especially the, um, no particular, it's a c- accumulation of experience that you get over the years. For instance, you know, I do a film. Uh, every film is another journey that you're learning something about. Recently, I did a film called The Engineer about the first suicide bombing uh, in 1992 in Israel. Mm-hmm. You know, I did a film called Terrorist on Trial, the United States of America versus Salim Ajmi, where I played a Palestinian 
kidnapped by the United States government to stand trial for acts of terrorism. That whole world, I then researched and uh, tried to understand the conflicts. Uh, FBI, whatever you're playing, it opens up another world. It's another big world that you can go into to see. I was in the Amazon rainforest in 1990 doing a film with Mika Kaurismaki, the first ecology film about the Garimpos and the gold diggers that were there in nine weeks, sleeping with the Yanomami Indians and uh, in the jungle of the Amazon. So you, you learn, and then you learn from your life experience. And um, uh, anything you can incorporate into your psyche, into your being, that's of a positive nature and uh, 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 enlightening nature, um, you try to take into. Uh, again, the Bond film, for instance, that was before everyone was talking about the drug lords of the world. You know what I mean? This was 1989. So I knew that whole world. When I did Profiler, FBI, profiling in the FBI before 9-11, I knew 9-11 was around the corner because of my, I went to Quantico and I submerged myself in that world. Um, uh, so every everything it, you, you do, uh, and then, uh, you know, d- d- directing. Mm-hmm. I directed a film called The Dukes. Uh, directed uh, the, the, the one nine awards with myself and uh, Chess Palminteri. It's about a duo, Peter Bogdanovich, who was great, great friend of mine. Directed recently a film that some people will like and some people won't. But it's it's a satire like American Hustle or The Wolf of Wall Street uh, about Hunter Biden's laptop. And somebody, they should look at it. It's a satire and it's funny, but it also exposes a certain other element. I was in Serbia and researching and everything else and understood a lot of other things. You, the worldview changes as you get closer to, uh, we're in our little boxes, mm-hmm. wherever we are in our city, in our town, in our homes, and on the media we watch and expose our ideas to. But when you travel the world, and you're seeing so many different aspects of that world. And I travel doing my music. My music is the most, to me, my most profound communication because it's 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 me and the audience and the music channeling, you know, the great American songbook and um, being able to express fully who I am as a human being. Right. And uh, so it's you know it's it's a it's a wide variety of of, of things and and being aware of our the conflicts and the uh, the hypocrisies and uh, so many different things in our in our in our world uh lock watcher says your music is nothing short of incredible robert how much influence did meeting sinatra have on you becoming a singer well first off in an italian household there are two figures especially Italian immigrant family, Uh, uh, the Pope and Sinatra, and not necessarily in that order. (laughs) I say that, I think I was the first to say that, now I've heard every Italian-American say the same quote. And uh, I I started saying that when I started doing my shows in 2010. And I said it in my documentary, Dobby's Way, you should take a look at that. I will. It's on iTunes. It's very funny. Very funny, self-deprecating, and very painful. Uh, I know that... uh, Leonard DiCaprio screened it at his house for three nights, and the guys were all laughing. And they, it's like a real insider uh, peek of the Hollywood thing, and uh, me wanting to do with something for Sinatra's 100th anniversary. But it's self deprecating, very funny, and very moving. But the, um, the music, uh, yes, yeah, Sinatra was the first singer to come out against anti Semitism and racial bigotry. He was, and, and that's the mess. Like, there's all of this talk about Sinatra and the mafia and this and that. And that's always around. And, you know, any Italian gets that, you know. Uh, there's always some kind of rumored aspect to whatever uh, one wants to shake of something. But the Sinatra's, uh, to me, the legacy of his fight against anti Semitism and racial bigotry, he really busted open the lines of blacks being able to be accepted in Vegas and other places. 
And that's the message that I like, because the American Songbook, also his Picasso-esque contribution to music. I mean, Sinatra's, you know, he, he, he was uh, the, 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 the first singer really to apply bel canto techniques of opera into the into uh, into popular music. He studied with a guy from the Metropolitan Opera, which I did, and uh, Dan Farrell at Juilliard, and then went on. So he so all the techniques that he used to communicate in his song and the depth he then later had with his acting and everything else. But to an Italian immigrant family, uh, he, he also gave because Italians in the 1906, the New York Times said they were lower and dirtier than the Negro. That's a quote from the New York Times back then. Uh, I don't know if they bleached that quote, but that's a quote that was there. Wow. And uh, there were more lynchings of Italians in 1886 in New Orleans in one day than any other race. Italians wow. were darkies, they were brownies, they were spit on. We, I myself remember grandparents telling me stories and also, you know, you, you would be looked at, you know, Italian, one of them Italians, you know, but it never, you know, we, we believed in pull yourself up from the bootstraps, not to be victimized, not to be victimized. And I think that, uh, so anyway, so Sinatra's music had a very strong influence uh, because you felt the lyric. A lot of singers will sing pretty notes, but when he, he you have to listen to Sinatra. He's not background music. And whether he's in joy or he's in pain, uh, you know, I, I call him the first method singer because he, the, the song was his, 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 his diary, mm. you know? I mean, it's quite interesting if you look at his body of over 3,000 songs that he sang. I mean, it's amazing. No one sounds like him. I mean, not no. even close. I mean, he's up there with Freddie Mercury. I mean, he's like, you hear that, you hear one second of it, you know exactly who that is. You know, That's, you're hearing his soul. That's it. You know, and um, again, the American Songbook is the amalgam of the American, and I, like, I love all kinds of music, but you mentioned Freddie Mercury. That's a great documentary, mm. a great film. Mm -hmm. And Delton John. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, so there, but there was something about Sinatra because he not only did film, he did TV, film, and music. And he was the first really major superstar like that back in the 1940s, you know? So he was such an affecting thing on my parents. And I saw, I'm sure in utero, I was listening to Frank Sinatra, you know? <laughs> so yeah, much like kids today are listening to Taylor Swift growing up, you know? She's like the phenomena of today in a certain way, Mac, among others. Mac Boland's conscious wants, wants to know, uh, what is specifically your favorite genre to work in, and how was it working with George Peppard? Ah, George Peppard. Excuse me, I apologize. Yeah, George Peppard. Yeah, he was a gentleman. You know, he was in the old style guy. I know he had connections with Shelley Winters, and he was, uh, yeah, he, he, was, he was a gentleman. He was fun. All those classic guys are all, you know, they were all wonderful. Um, I like multi-genre. You know, I, 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 I like even comedy. You know, I did Cops and Robertsons and The Hot Chick. And I think I'm, even The Dukes has a bit of comedy, a lot of comedy in it, if you see it. Um, you can go to Amazon and watch that. It's fun. It's about a doo-wop group that, that pulls a heist of dental gold because Chaz loses his front tooth. And I overhear, we don't have money to pay the dentist, and I overhear about a bunch of gold in the dental lab. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite fun. Um, you'll see. you got to see it, David. You gotta, That's but, great. <laughs> obviously, the dukes, yeah, take a look at it. But anyway, so, yeah, so the genres, and well, what was that question from, uh, from uh, George Peppard? Yes. He was, yeah, and, and I like multi-genres. Uh, it's fun to mix it up. Urias Tosh, uh, Robert, what is more fulfilling for your spirit, acting or creating music? Well, they're both, both have it, but there's something about the music when I'm singing. That's uh, another channeling aspect because it's a, uh, it's, it's a direct connection to the audience. 
you know, film is wonderful and acting and doing a play is wonderful. Uh, but for me, when I'm doing a concert and I can sing what I want to sing, I could talk about what I want to discuss with the audience, you know, uh, communicate to them and feel that what they're feeling, that communal, that there's nothing that's beautiful. I've done it for 18,000 people on Long Island. I've done it for 6,000 in Estonia, 3,000 in Budapest and all over the world. I've been doing this and I'll be in Massachusetts September in September at the big E. So anybody in that area, come and see me. I'm doing two concerts on the big E. I think it's the 20th and 21st of September. Okay. But uh, yeah, come and see what it's about. But there's nothing like, like that communication. Dan Ben wanted to know, what is it like using certain props, both in Atlantis and in other projects that you worked in, guns, rifles, other technology? What, what goes into that in terms of behind the scenes, in terms of you getting the training that you need and being provided the, uh, the techniques that you need to do it safe? Uh, there's there's got to be a lot that goes into that. You can't just pull it out and go bang. You know, There's, there's a whole process there. Well, first off, and, and just to go back to that other question, the good thing, the thing for film is that it's lasting. Once yeah. you do a performance, it's over. But the beauty of film is like Goonies and Bond and Die Hard and Showgirls and films that last on TV, Stargate, decades from now, people are going to be talking about it or see it. So there's that aspect to it that's very satisfying to that. Uh, going back to that training, look, an actor should train in many aspects. Mm. Um, I did a Western early on. And, um, you know, they said, can you ride a horse? I go, I can ride a subway. You know, because I came from New York. But immediately they put me, you know, I, 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 I trained on a, uh, with the best, Terry Leonard. They, they taught me the horse skills. And I was practicing on horses. I was practicing gunplay. And uh, with the, the, the quickest, fast draw guy. And you have if they take it very seriously there's never 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 multitudes of being able to to uh protect yourself and be because accidents can happen mm -hmm. so it's very 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 sure of and i'll give you one thing with myself this was back in 1979 or something i'm doing a thing called legend of the golden gun i'm we're at spawn ranch and i'm rehearsing and i'm I'm with this big quick draw guy, you know what I mean? He's teaching me quick draw. So there's a certain way to do it that it's safe and a certain way to do it that it's not safe. Mm -hmm. So I inadvertently being inexperienced as a, you know, I'm doing the quick draw and it's, it's in your leg. You know what I mean? That you have the, the gun to your, to your leg. So I figure, okay, I'll skip one of the, one of the things to be quicker at the, at the, at the, and I was very quick. And I do it, and I triggered it. And my jeans, about a, a foot of my jeans ripped up because of the, the, the shot. It was a full load. Uh, wow. It wasn't a, a bullet, but it was a full load that gave that spark. So the gene, and I, you know, seared the side of my thigh a little bit where that thing was. And uh, it was nothing. It was just very, very superficial. But I'm, you know, oh my God, look at this. They, and they're laughing. They go, you know, I go, what do I do? Look at this. And the guy goes, hey, hey, Bob, get some of that. Let that horse piss on his leg here. That'll clean that up in two seconds. You know, their sense of humor about stuff. But all throughout my life, any gunplay, they could say to you, 10 people can say, all clear. Yeah, it's a clear gun. I give it to you. You go, let me check it out for myself. Right. And it up and, and you say okay you even you they say don't dry shoot it i go fuck that i'm gonna dry shoot it to make sure make sure so i check the chambers no matter who gives it to me and i've always done that and i know there was an unfortunate accident with someone and uh, you're given a weapon you check it yourself absolutely Brian McCann uh, wanted to know, how was it filming um, in an episode of Incredible Hulk with Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno? Yeah, well, Lou was always a friend. Lou was a friend, good guy, Louie. And uh, Bixby was great. You know, it's funny. 
I've gotten along over the years, thank God, with every uh, everyone I've worked with, and uh, they were all very gracious, and it was all fun, you know. I mean, it was. Uh, I got their respect, and I gave them my respect, and it was mm -hmm. a collaborative and a fun fun experience. And it was fun doing those shows because you met people, you know, that that will, you know, of the day. You met those TV stars of the day um, uh, on all those guest star shows. You know, I think I was, I, I kind of have an interesting thing because I'm, I'm, those days are gone. Mm. You got to realize, you know, I mean, back in the, the late 70s, you had a lodge in the, in the 80s. There was a whole other vibe. It was a transitional time to what we have today, which is not as, it's, creative but there's something a dignity that's lost i feel there is a uh, uh, a certain kind of uh, certain kind of je ne sais quoi that, that's lost mm -hmm. it was great yeah bixby was great and lou was nice and charlie napier was in that too charles napier mm. yeah Legendary. that old-time guy your body of work I'm, I'm looking at some of this stuff i was on the phone with my best friend last night and he was like i loved him in profiler can you tell us about profiler for for zach yeah zach the profiler was a great show um it was the first of its kind yeah they had done shows dealing with aliens and stuff but never never like like profiling like the silence of the lambs so this was like that and I played a character, Bailey Malone, who created Profile. <clears throat> and I trained this young blue light, uh, Allie Walker, Samantha Waters, into profiling. And she became the bright star of, of, of profiling. And uh, it was a, a John, uh, Julian McMahon was in it, you know, since we had a great cast. Peter Frechette, Roma uh, Mafia. And um, the uh, uh, it was the first of its kind. I think NBC had a night of three shows, and they didn't expect us to do so well at ten o'clock. And I think we we got a nineteen share, nineteen share on a Saturday night at ten o'clock. That blew them away. We beat the other shows, and we continued on that way. And then um, uh, uh, that great producers Ian Sanders and Kim Moses. Ian passed away recently, um, and um, it was right after the O.J. Simpson trial. So I knew that the public was hungry about blood spatters, about crime scene analysis. They were glued to that set. So now this fed that, mm. fed into that thing. It gave you a lesson in terms of that. And um, Ali, the show was very dark, and she just had a baby, and she didn't want that darkness and so she left the show and the producers this Garth Anseer guy who made a big mistake you know it's like changing generals on the Titanic they they get rid of a guy that's successful and they put a new guy in and he wants to now change everything that's successful and put his own and it doesn't so he wanted to put on extreme football and we had a nice actress Jamie uh, Luna take over for Ali. And I told the producers and the writers, I said to them, guys, you can't divorce mommy and bring in the new mommy. The audience won't accept her. You can't make her. So they wanted to make Jamie Luna, who's a terrific person, another Ali Walker. I said, she can't do that. Jamie has a different energy. She came from Melrose Place. She's a bit of a little sexy girl. You have to change this. I said, so what you have to do is you have to take Ali Walker, uh, you have to take Jamie Luna and you have to say, okay, Bailey Malone needs a new profiler. Mm -hmm. was Ali. And get six candidates because there's several steps to profiling. So he takes two inside law enforcement, three outside law enforcement, and he starts training them. Each episode is trying to see who's going to be the new profiler. What's, who's Bailey going to train? And there are steps. So you bring the audience also each episode for the first half of a season. 12 episodes, you let them see the steps of profiling and the struggle of us because it's more than one profile. You know, we had other people, so they could mm -hmm. 
around the table. It was Criminal Minds before Criminal Minds, which I then pitched to CBS and NBC in 2003. And Hollywood is very like yeah. Pac-Man. But so what happens is they didn't do that. And, and I said, then who, who emerges is this cocktail waitress from Baltimore, Maryland, who's working with local law enforcement, and she becomes the person Bailey's going to train and going to be this great movie. Then the audience is going to love her. She's going to be scared. She's going to be this. She could be that. She doesn't have to come in and be the, the top dog right now. I'm coming in now replacing Ali Walker. Audience won't accept it. Like I said, you can't divorce mommy and say, you got to subdue the. And that's what happened. So the ratings got hurt. Uh, Garth Van Seer wanted to put on extreme football. And our ratings weren't hurt. We were still doing 11, 12 share. But he, he cleaned out the whole Saturday night, put on extreme football with those helmets, and took a $150 million bath, and he got fired. Meanwhile, CBS winds up doing criminal minds, and she they do the criminal intent, and all these other... F- and they're still running. Yeah. Profile is off the air. So the stupidity of NBC, Universal at the time, or whoever they were, and I pitched them. And then I pitched them a show while I was at Profiler called Liget about the FBI and international territories. This is in 2000, I think. 2000, and 2001. And great show. And, uh, you know, and also with... I wanted immediate internet access to the show. So stuff that's happening now, 20 years ago, I pitched to NBC. The, uh, GE owned NBC at the time. And then CBS in 2003. And got shut out for whatever reason, you know. And people take a run, run when they see a good thing, they run with it, you know, but sometimes yeah, in a well, different direction. Yeah, well, CBS said, we don't want to do any more procedural. And then mm. two years later, an unknown writer comes up with the thing I pitched them. Mm. So go figure. But, uh, you know, and that that's a little bit of sour grapes, but that's the world. Yeah. That's the world we're in. We're in a world of corruption, mm. unfortunately. Before I wrap up with you, I, I want to I wanna come back to Kolya one last time. I loved uh, your return of the character with the character in season five. First of all, I, I think the 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 shootout uh, in season three, which which knocked him off, um, it's it's a it's a great western moment, but it just drove me nuts. I, do, I didn't think it was fair to the character to have him go out that way. If if I'm perfectly honest, oh yeah, to go out that way. Yeah, exactly. Shepard shoots him dead. I mean, at least Shepard does. At least there's that. He doesn't get. Cole doesn't get shot in the back, but still, I mean, I wish it had they had gone a different route. Yeah, me too. I thought it was kind of rinky dink. Yeah. I mean, they were better than that. Right. They were better they were, than that. They were better than that. And you should ask Joe Malazzo why the hell that they chose that. Why was it that? You know what I'm saying? Where there could have been, you know, many different ways of doing it. Because I was in Collier's head at the uh, Shepherd's head at the time, right? Mm hmm. Was yeah, I, that and yeah. when you returned in season five, uh, you were in Shepard's head, and I thought that it was, a, I thought that it was a great return because it was a fantastic sci-fi premise. You cut off his hand for Frick's sake. I mean, for a while there, we're sitting there like, oh my god! Not only is this person brought back from the dead, he's just main, maimed our hero. It was a right. great episode, and then brilliant. Yes, and then. <laughs> Sorry? Go ahead, go ahead, finish that. And then he turns, it turns around, and he is a, a part of this other entity who is, uh, Kolya is finally being seen as, as something neutral for the first time. Like a glimpse of what Kolya could have been like if we had gone in a different direction with him. I thought it was a great return for you, and I'm thrilled that they did it. Yeah, yeah, I am too. Except getting shot like that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you can't win them all. Um, I, 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 Robert, I have been looking forward to you, uh, to, to this for hoping to sit down with you for a long time. I cannot thank Angelique enough for making uh, this possible. You, I hope you realize just how significant a part you played in Stargate Atlantis in making um, uh, that show 
what it was. It, this has been a treat, and I and I hope you realize just uh, how important you were to that show. Hmm. Well, thank you, David. That's very sweet. I, yeah, I I didn't know. <laughs> I mean, I know I know every once in a while. I'll get a, a, you know, somebody will say, Kolya! And I'm surprised that there's such a, you know, then I go tease along and go, yes, Kolya was. <laughs> Augustus Kolya. Absolutely. It was fun. They should have his, they should bring him back and have him do his own thing. Yeah, Raj Luthra, if asked, would you return? <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because he was a great character. How could you not? Absolutely. You know? They should do a, uh, yeah, I'm surprised, you know, stuff like that when that happens, if enough audience members really appreciate the character, then they do something about it. You know what I mean? Sometimes. But who knows? Absolutely. Would you be willing to do Stargate conventions? Uh, a Stargate convention? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be fun. Yeah. Meet the fans. Yeah, have, have them bring you up to sing as well, you know, for the, yeah. for the, yeah. for the cabaret dinner. That would be really cool. I think that you would be perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one's approached me, so maybe somebody will. Absolutely. Robert, thank you again, sir. This has been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the show on this end, and uh, thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to meet you, and I'm sure we'll do it again. Thank you, sir. You be well. You too. Bye-bye. Robert Davi, everyone. Acostas Kolya in Stargate Atlantis, one of my favorite um, guest stars uh, in the franchise. And this was this this was a real treat. And thank you to Angelique, uh, my dear friend, uh, for for setting this up. She uh, uh, she knows him personally. Uh, thank you all for joining me early this uh, this Wednesday uh, for this episode, and a big thanks to uh, my uh, my team of moderators. I have uh, uh, Tracy and Jeremy, and uh, I think Anthony in there as well, guys. Uh, you really pulled this one out of the hat last minute. Uh, didn't know until last night what the exact schedule was going to be, um, but. Uh, yeah, it was terrific to have him. Thanks to uh, Linda Gategaber Fury, my producer, uh, and uh, Frederick Marcou at Concepts Web for keeping dialthegate.com uh, up and running. Let's look at the schedule really quickly here because a lot is going to be coming up in really short order as we're uh, bringing um, Dial the Gate Season 3 to its end here. Steve Basic is joining us this afternoon at 12 noon Pacific Times to discuss uh, Major Coburn and Camulus. Uh, I have Gwyneth Walsh coming towards you. A uh, pre-recorded interview. She played Egeria in Stargate SG-1. I have it currently set for, for Saturday, June 17th. That may switch around depending on another guest. Uh, we have Stargate Trivia 9, hosted by Colin Cunningham. This Saturday, the 17th at 12 noon Pacific time. And then the 24th, the following Saturday, Rob Fournier, armorer for Stargate SG-1, Atlantis, and Universe. So we are going to uh, uh, be finishing Season 3 uh, with a bang, as it were. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in to Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed, and I will be seeing you on the other side. <laughs>